All right. I think it's about time to get started. Um, welcome back from lunch. Welcome to the first real tutorial today. Um, this will be Geodynamics tutorial number one. Um, and we will be talking about some of the concepts that Bruce introduced in his lecture this morning, uh, but also some more uh, slightly different features of convection. Um, and this tutorial will be about one of the available software tools in geodynamics that is often used to model all kinds of geodynamic processes. Um, the software is called ASPECT, which stands for Advanced Solver for Problems in Earth's Convection. And um, during this tutorial, we will use ASPECT, which is already installed on your virtual machine, to run some simple geodynamic calculations and to see if we can learn anything from that. Um, there are some users of ASPECT already in the audience who might be able or who are willing and have uh, agreed to uh, look around and, no, you didn't agree? <laughs> okay, so there are some users in the audience who can help you with some problems if you run into any during the tutorial. Um, can I ask the users of ASPECT in the audience to just sign up for a second just so you can see who you can talk to? Oh, they all sit in the last row <laughs> except for Eva. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> um, so let's get started. Um, if you haven't started your virtual machine by now, now would be a good time to do so on your laptops. I will speak for a few minutes and then we will dive right into that, but it's easier if you already start up the virtual machine now. Aspect is a relatively new software project in the uh, geodynamics, although it is also already five, six, seven years old. Um, it uh, builds on a number of principles um, and that is it tries to use modern numerical methods uh, which in particular means it uses an adaptive mesh structure as you saw on the first slide. So some parts of the model are better resolved than others depending on the problem we are interested in. Um, <laughs> it uses advanced linear and nonlinear solvers, higher order discretizations and parallel scalability. Um, but also we try to use uh, modern software development techniques and that is something that has come up in the sciences only over the last years. Um, there are very advanced techniques in uh, commercial software development by now that have proven to be efficient and uh, to produce just better software than 20 years ago. Uh, and we are trying to apply, uh, apply some of these uh, techniques also in the development of ASPECT and the other codes that are developed at the computational infrastructure for geodynamics. In particular, we do peer code review, uh, which means no line of code that you will use to run your models uh, was not reviewed by one of us. Um, so everything is reviewed by at least one other developer. Uh, we use a system to continuously test the code with the same set of tests over and over again every time we do a change to avoid uh, any unforeseen problems or bugs that we didn't think about. Um, Aspect uses an extensible plugin architecture so that if you want to change something ab about the code, you don't have to dive into the details uh, of, of the core structure. You can most likely uh, create your model by just changing one of the outer plugins, which is much simpler than uh, trying to modify the core structure. And I could give a full lecture on this, but I won't at the moment because we don't have the time. But um, we try to keep the code usable and extensible um, with uh, well um, documentation and a big manual of uh, 450 pages by now. Um, we try to build on others' work and this is um, also something relatively new. Um, there are big numerical libraries out there that are designed to solve uh, hard problems, that are designed to solve um, big linear systems. And instead of recoding everything from scratch by ourselves, uh, we decided to use these available resources um, to avoid uh, duplication of efforts, essentially. And finally, ASPECT is from the beginning designed as a community software, which means it is under an open source license, but it is not only under an open source license, it is also developed in the open, which means uh, we develop the code on GitHub and you can follow the development step by step. Um, and We've tried to form a community that encourages contributions from everybody. So you are most welcome to download the code, make modifications, give us the modifications back. And um, we try to be welcoming to all of these modifications to incorporate them into the main code and make the software better over time. And this is essentially 
summarized on this slide. As I said, you're welcome to use Aspect uh, for your project. Um, please cite Aspect if you use it, because that's important for us to assess the um, to assess the usability of Aspect and also to prove to our funding agencies that the software is useful. Um, we cannot guarantee suitability for any particular project, but we try to make it as general as possible. And so far, it has been used for all kinds of applications in geodynamics, um, from extra planet, exoplanets to subduction models uh, to whole mantle convection models to inner core models to things we never thought about when we started the development of Aspect. We encourage your contributions back to the main version, um, which is useful for us because the software gets better, but it's also useful for you because your contributions will be kept compatible with the main version of Aspect, so you, it's more easy for you to switch to a new version. Um, you automatically comply with all of the data availability statements that you have to make for many of the journals by now. And also, you get recognition from our community because every change you make will be kept in the change log of the software and you will appear in our newsletter um, about the recently added features. Um, so it's also a way for you to get some, some feedback and some credit for the work that you do while you develop the software. As I mentioned, the software is transparently um, developed on GitHub. So you can, uh, under this web address, see what is going on at the moment, which new features are added and which discussions are going on. Um, and I would be very happy to see some of you on GitHub uh, discussing changes you would like to have or um, contributing your modifications. You can find more information on our website, aspect.geodynamics.org. Um, we have by now a large uh, number of maintainers and, and many, many contributors to the software, and by now around 30 publications citing Aspect. And so much about the commercial part of the talk. Um, Aspect is already installed on the virtual machine that you installed yesterday. And I would like you to log into your virtual machine using the user geodynamics um, at the start screen. And the, the use of aspect is specified by a file that you provide to aspect, which is called a parameter file. It's a simple text file, and it defines the geodynamic problem that you want to solve. And we will have a look at these files. Um, but essentially what you will see in these files is you will determine the, the mesh that you use to solve the equations that Bruce introduced this morning. Uh, you will see parameters for the material um, that that the material properties that we are going to use about the initial conditions and the boundary conditions. And hopefully, when we are finished with this tutorial, uh, you will be able to run Aspect from the command line inside of your virtual machine. You will approximately understand how these parameter files are organized and how you could change them to run new models. Um, we will talk about how to visualize the model output that you get from Aspect. And uh, hopefully, if I do this job correctly, you will understand the concept of a buoyancy ratio, um, which uh, determines the interaction between a thermal and a chemical density contrast in mantle convection. So to dive right into the tutorial, um, if you have already started your virtual machine, then you can open a Linux terminal by pressing Control alt t or you double-click the LX terminal shortcut on the desktop of your virtual machine. You can then change to the tutorial directory, which is named by typing cd space desktop slash dash aspect And then you can start aspect with this command. And in order to make this simpler, I will put the presentation on the right-hand side of the screen, if it appears. There we go. And I will do the same steps in the virtual machine on my laptop on the left-hand side. So I opened the, a terminal in the virtual machine. I will go to the tutorial directory. This is a bit unfortunate.
Let me completely switch to the virtual machine. That makes it simpler to show the command. So the, the backslash that you saw in the presentation is actually just a sign to break the line. You can also type all of the commands into the same line. So it's MPI run space dash NP space two space aspect dash release space driven thermochemical convection. And if you read the instructions on the tutorial wiki, you can always autocomplete these commands by pressing tab uh, whenever you just type the first few letters of something in the terminal. Aspect release should be in the path of the virtual machine and should start. Um, so if everything works correctly, you should see a lot of text output appear in the terminal like this. If not, I'll go back to the presentation so that you can take another look at the commands. Well, you can. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> it does? That's interesting. OK, then don't, don't type the backslash. <laughs> OK, it worked for some. OK. Either way, um, if everything worked, then you should see a lot of text appearing in the terminal on your screen. Um, some of this is actually interesting, but we can't follow it because it's going too fast. Um, but Aspect also copies all of this, this output into a directory um, that is a subdirectory of the one you're currently in. Um, it's called output-driven thermochemical convection. It's um, the output directory where all of the output of Aspect will be stored. And the file is called log.txt. And we can take a look at this file. Um, if you open a new terminal, again, press Control alt t go to the same directory, and then we will use a software called leafpad um, to take a look at the content of this file. So again, I will do the same commands in the virtual machine. Open a new terminal, then change the directory to the same one we were in before. Use the software called leafpad. And open the file log.txt in the subdirectory output-driven thermochemical convection. And then you should see a text editor opening uh, with all of the output that appears in the terminal, um, just in a more organized way. Is everyone approximately at this stage? Any problems? Some problems? Um, if I can use yeah. uh, Joe, can you take a look? Okay.
Yeah. Okay, it seems like most people are at this stage. So let's take a quick look at the content of this file. The beginning of the file consists of uh, some generic output from Aspect, um, but it's actually kind of useful to have this output there. It consists of the version number of Aspect. In particular, also it includes the uh, git commit hash, which is a unique identifier for this particular version of Aspect that we are using at the moment. This way, you will always be able to reproduce this model with exactly the same version of Aspect that you are running right now. And you circumvent a usual problem in geodynamics. You ran a model two years ago on some cluster you have no access anymore to, and you don't remember which kind of version you used for this model. Instead of storing a copy of Aspect every time you run a model, you can now rely on, on this file to recover exactly the version that you used um, and rerun this model. It also lists the major versions of the dependencies that we used. Um, I'm going to talk about optimized and debug mode later and how many MPI processes you used. And it includes a reference for how to cite this model, um, which is very useful if you want to write a publication out of this model. Afterwards, um, the usual aspect output of the main time step loop appears. Um, it includes the number of active cells of your mesh that you use at the moment, some information about the model time at the moment and how much solver iterations were needed to, to make this time step. Um, and then it includes some post-processing quantities. For example, in, it includes a reference to a graphical output file called solution, uh, some particle output, and some statistics about temperature and compositions in the model. Um, yes? Um, those are separate things because this way you are able to combine aspect with different versions of, uh, of these libraries. We have, we have an install progr program that, that um, installs all of these libraries for you. Um, so you don't have to do everything manually, but we don't bundle these libraries inside of aspect. Um, you are usually able to use the most recent versions. There are some combinations of older versions that are not possible. Maybe you tried it at a time when there was something particularly happening. But usually, so Aspect usually supports definitely the latest release of DL2 and most of the time also the second most yeah, recent. Yeah, like DL2 as much as it was things like the Tronos or the other. Yeah, so yeah. It seems like you need to use slightly older ones to get to work. It sometimes doesn't always. That that is not the normal state. The normal state is that we support the, um, the newest versions. And if you run into problems, um, you can always use the installer to install a, a completely separate set of all of these libraries. Um, OK, so much about the output. Um, but I also didn't tell you anything about the model that we actually run. Um, most likely, the model is still running on your laptops. Maybe it has already finished. But while we are waiting, um, we can take a look at what we actually did there. Um, and in order to do this, we will have a look at the parameter file that we used to run this computation. So I would like you to close the uh, text editor window that you just opened and open a new text editor window um, of the file called driven thermochemical convection.prm. If you are still in the same terminal as before, you are likely already in this folder and you don't need to type cd again. If you open a new terminal window, then you will have to go into this folder and then type leafpad space driven underscore thermochemical underscore convection.prm. I'll repeat these steps in the virtual machine. So it's leafpad space driven underscore thermochemical underscore convection dot PRM. Mm -hmm. 
And if you press enter, you should see a new text editor window appear. Is this something that worked for everybody? Okay. Look. Yes, if, if you're absolutely terrified of, of the terminal, then you can reach all of these spaces from the desktop. So as you can see, the, um, the parameter file for aspect is, is just a regular text file. Um, there's no magic behind this. It has a relatively straightforward syntax, which means uh, every line that starts with a hash is a comment. Um, every parameter that you want to set starts with a set. And there are some subsections in this uh, parameter file which start with subsection and end with end. Now let's see what the content of this parameter file says. So apparently we're starting a two-dimensional model Always remember, 2D is much simpler and faster than 3D, and we are only doing 2D models here because it has to run on your laptops. Um, we let the model run for 5E9, which means years, because we set this parameter to true. Um, one, one word about units here. Um, Aspect internally doesn't care about which unit system you are using. You just have to make sure that it is consistent. So you can use an SI unit system and just use SI units for everything and it will work. You can also use a non-dimensional unit system. You just have to make sure that everything you use in this parameter file is in non-dimensional units and that this unit system is consistent. In this case, we are using SI units and because we set this special parameter, uh, we actually convert every time unit into years instead of seconds because it's much more intuitive to speak of five billion years then, for example, what is it? 10 to the 22 seconds or so? <laughs> no, 10 to the 17, whatever. So, um, next comes the subsection that's called geometry model. And we are here using a geometry that is called box. And there's a subsection for the box, and it says it's about 2,890 kilometers wide, 2,890 kilometers deep. So apparently it's about the size of the Earth's mantle, at least in depth. Um, this also means there are other geometries available. If you would like to model the mantle as a spherical shell, which is kind of closer to what the Earth actually is, uh, then you can use that as well. In the next subsections, we set boundary temperatures to be 2,700 Kelvin at the core metal boundary, 273 at the surface. Uh, you might notice that this temperature is actually quite low compared to what you would estimate for Earth's core metal boundary temperature. But remember the discussion this morning about um, the Businesk approximation. In a Businesk approximation, you actually have no adiabatic temperature gradient with depth. So in order to get realistic temperature jumps at the surface and at the core metal boundary, you have to remove the adiabatic temperature increase with depth from the core mental boundary temperature. Otherwise, we would overestimate the temperature jump across the boundary. What is the um, temperature uh, change just due to this? 1,000 Kelvin, Kelvin. more or less. The next subsection deals with the boundary velocity and um, we kind of touched upon this this morning during the lecture. Um, here we prescribe a tangential velocity at the left, right, and bottom boundary. And tangential in this context means we prescribe the velocity to have a zero normal component to the boundary, but it's completely stress-free if it just moves along the boundary. So this would be, it, it's kind of a good approximation, for example, for the surface um, or uh, for a tank. It's not so good if you think about it in terms of the Earth, because on the Earth, material can actually move around the spherical shell without boundaries. So we are imposing an, an artificial boundary here um, that essentially does not exist on Earth. Um, and we prescribe velocities at the surface in form of a function. And this function is defined in this subsection 
and the function expression says that the x component of velocity is one centimeter per year, which in the coordinate system of the model, if you think about it, is to the right, and the y component of velocity is zero. So we have material that is flowing along the surface to the right. We specify gravity, the initial temperature model, and again, we use a function plugin for this and specify that the temperature is 1800 Kelvin if the y coordinate is smaller than 500 kilometers, which is the bottom part of the model, and it's 1000 Kelvin in the upper part of the model. So we kind of pre-impose a higher temperature in a bottom boundary, well, it's not kind of boundary layer, but in, in the bottom part of the model. Then we specify some parameters for the material properties in the model. In particular, we set a density differential for some kind of composition in the model. We don't know yet where this composition will be, but apparently it has a density difference to the rest of the material of 150 kilogram per cubic meter. We specify something about the resolution of the model. That's not of much interest at the moment. Um, we prescribe that there is one compositional field in this model, so one compositional anomaly. You can think of it as an anomaly. And um, I give it a name here, and this name gives a away a lot about the model. It's called basal layer. Um, and we also have to specify where this basal material actually is. And again, we use a function plugin for this and say, um, if the y coordinate is smaller than 500 kilometers, then there is a compositional anomaly there, and we give this a value of 1, and there is no compositional anomaly in the rest of the model. Uh, in the end, we specify something about post processing the solution and how to output um, the, the result of the solution, um, but that's not of much interest at the moment. Um, of more interest is that most likely most of your models have finished. Um, could you check in the terminal if your model is finished and has stopped producing output? Okay, then let's see if we can see something um, and if you can visualize this output so that you can see something about the, the model that you just ran. I had a few slides here about the equations that we solved, but since Bruce did a very good job this morning and introduced all of them. Um, I'll skip over them. Um, maybe one quick remark. Um, not about this slide. And that is if you take a look at the final set of equations um, that aspect solves, um, then in theory they are the same equations um, with the same terms. Um, they are written slightly differently. For example, um, we decided to immediately drop out all of the inertia terms um, that Bruce showed this morning um, because they are just so big that we neglect them. So um, all accelerations happen so fast that the velocity field is always in equilibrium with the forces that currently create this velocity field. Um, on the other hand, um, we did not remove the assumption, or we don't, did not assume that density is constant. Um, we kept, for example, here in the conservation of mass, um, the term is not divergence of u equals zero, but the divergence of the density times u equals zero. Um, so if density changes, uh, if density is constant, we can, of course, remove the row from here, put it in front, then divide by row, it's never zero, and then we just end up with the usual incompressibility assumption. Uh, in this case, we keep the row in here. For the model that we are running at the moment, we actually run the incompressible approximation. So don't worry about that. But in case you're interested, um, you could keep this term, uh, this row in here and solve it that way. Actually, there it is quite involved mathematically how to solve this in the end. So I'm not going to talk about it, but in theory, it's possible. Okay, um, in order to visualize the model that you just ran, we will use a software that is called Paraview. Uh, Paraview is an open source program for the visualization of very large and very diverse data sets. It's not at all related to geodynamics. It's used in a lot of physics um, and a lot of disciplines of physics and, and engineering. Um, 
it is already installed on your virtual machine and you can open it now by typing paraview in any terminal window, either a new one or one in the terminal that you currently have open. Paraview supports all kinds of visualization tools for complex processes and models. It can draw isosurfaces, slices, streamlines, and every kind of complicated volume visualization. Um, if it opened correctly, you will likely see a window similar to this one. Slightly different because you're using a different operating system, but the Paraview window should look very similar. Um, so the most important things are in the top left corner, you see a button to open new files and to open data sets. Um, you have some toolbars at the top, uh, which allow you to interact with the data and visualize the data in different ways. Um, you have a pipeline. It's something that is called a pipeline browser on the left hand side, which shows all of the data sets that you have open at the moment. Um, an object inspector down here that allows you to uh, modify the visualization and a big part of the screen is reserved for the visualization itself. In order to visualize the model that you just ran, you can open a file that is called solution.xdmf. So first click on this open file button in the top left that I showed on the previous slide. And then find the file solution.xdmf, which is in this folder. If you opened a new terminal, then you will have to go to the folder desktop dash aspect output dash driven thermal chemical convection and you will find the file in there. If you opened Paraview from a terminal that was already in the desktop dash aspect folder, then you will just need to go to the folder output dash driven thermal chemical convection. Any problems finding the file? Well, yes, just choose the one that is already selected. Now the file should appear in the pipeline browser to the left. But you will not see anything in the visualization window until you click on the apply button below the pipeline browser. The reason for this is that Paraview allows you to read in very large data sets, then modify them before you actually load them into the memory of your laptop in case the whole data set would be too big for your, for your laptop. You should then probably see a, visualiz a visualization like this in the main window of Paraview. Um, a one by one box with some blue to red colors in it. Is that what happens? Yes. Very good. <laughs> in this case, it automatically visualizes the temperature field at the beginning of the model run that we had. And you can also visualize different fields than the temperature in, the, uh, in a selection box in the top toolbar of Paraview, uh, which should currently say T for temperature, but you can also choose other quantities there. Now, this is the first task for you as ongoing computational geodynamicists. Do you think this state represents what we just saw in the parameter file. Did we do anything wrong in setting up this model? Or is this exactly what we expected? Looks correct. OK, yeah, uh, it, it is correct. Um, <laughs> Exactly, yeah. Um, so we had an if y smaller than 500 kilometers, and here we see something of a transition. Um, why is that? If you think about it, we, yeah? Well, aspect allows for sharp transitions, but we discretized the model domain in some, in, in form of some mesh, in, in, so, in some form of um, uh, representation of the actual continuous domain. 
And what we here used was the finite element method, which kind of splits the domain into, into many small cells, and we solve the equation on each of these cells. And of course, we cannot represent sharper gradients than essentially the size of this cell. In reality, it's even a bit more complicated. Um, Aspect internally tries to represent the solution in terms of um, quadratic functions on each of these cells. This is what is called a second order finite element. Paraview is only able to visualize linear functions. So Paraview will just take the values at each mesh point and interpolate the values linearly between them. And that is why we see these gradients here. Internally in Aspect, these gradients are actually somewhat sharper, but they are still gradients over a certain distance. Um, so we cannot expect a discontinuous jump if we discretize everything in terms of a continuous function over the discretization that we have available. Okay, um, the reason why I included this exercise was that this is something that you should always do if you run a geodynamic model. You always kind of set up your model in this parameter file and you hope that everything will work exactly as you think. Um, but you should always check in the model output whether this looks reasonable. Never trust a model where you just see the model output and you have no idea what you would expect to happen. Now this first state is actually relatively boring if you look at it. But Paraview also has the option to visualize the evolution of the model. Um, in the top toolbar, you can find some, uh, some buttons that look like uh, the buttons that you have on your video recorder at home. If you have, still have something like this. Um, so there's a play button uh, in the top toolbar. And if you press on this play button, then you will see an evolution of the model over time. And I will reproduce this in the virtual machine. So I click on the, on the play button and as you can see, there is some blue material moving down on the right hand side of the model. Uh, you see some lighter, slightly white to red material moving up on the left hand side. And after a while, everything kind of comes to a standstill. You still see time moving up here, but there's nothing much changing in the temperature field uh, of the model domain. Now here comes the second question. Um, is there still material moving in this domain? Y yes, why? Why do you think that? We, because we prescribed it in, in the parameter file. Okay, yeah, that, that's true. Um, but you couldn't tell from this, from this output whether there is material that is moving or whether it's just the temperature field that is constant over time. So in order to visualize this, um, you can also load tracer particles into Paraview. And uh, you can do this on your laptops as well. You can open another file. Um, in the same folder as the solution.xdmf, there is a file that is called particles.xdmf. And if you click on OK and also choose the pre-selected option, and click on apply and go back to the first time step by clicking on this button in the, in the top toolbar. Then you will see that the, that the output changes. Um, the temperature field that we saw before is now overlain by a large number of, of particles. And these particles are colored according to something that is called ID. It just means each of these particles has a unique ID um, that you can use to track this particular particle. And if you now run the model over time, click on the play button again, then you will see how these particles move over time. And although the temperature field didn't change at the end anymore, you can, if you wait until the end of the model run, you can observe that these particles are actually still moving. And these particles are a good way to give you an intuition of how the material is actually moving in the model. You see how everything rotates clockwise in the upper half of the domain. 
And you can also see that everything rotates counterclockwise in this lower bottom part of the domain. So in this case, the color is not temperature scale? No, in this case, the color is not any longer temperature. It's the ID of the particles. No, it doesn't have any physical meaning. Well, there, yeah. Okay. Uh, there is a second way um, you could alternatively. Um, it, it does relate to the initial position, right? Because you get a, a gradient. Exactly. Yes. So yes. It, it just means that red comes from the, the right hand side of the panel and the blue comes from the Yes, okay. exactly. So it shows the it, it was not random, but it it's right. unique to each of these IDs. And you can actually say something about this because you see where the right-hand side of the domain ends up, and it ends up in this kind of spiral shape in the upper half of the domain. No, the, the boundary conditions are uh, prescribed velocities at the surface to the right, and a free slip boundary condition on the other three sides, which means no normal flow and stress-free flow tangential, uh, tangential to the boundary. It's laterally confined, yes, yes. So left and right edge are not connected to each other? No, okay. it's not. And as I mentioned, this, this is artificial. This is not what is happening on Earth, because in a spherical shell, you wouldn't have these side right. boundaries. So I will come back to this point. If I remove the particles for a second, by clicking on this little I button next to the particles and visualize a different field than the temperature, namely this, this compositional field that we gave the name basal layer, you will see that all of the material that was at the bottom of the domain in the beginning still is at the bottom of the domain at the end. Apparently, it's so much denser than the rest of the material that it is not entrained in the rest of the flow. Okay, so we have some preliminary conclusions from this first model that we are in. The, the cold downwelling material deforms this dense basal layer. If you take a look at this visualization, you see that the dense material is actually pushed down on this side of the domain and it kind of is pushed up a bit on the left side of the domain. The temperature in this basal layer remains hotter than in the material above, even over time. So there's a, there's a big region of elevated temperature in this bottom domain. Both the layer and the background material are convecting. You have seen that both of them move around and they, they move around in a way that the upper material kind of drives the, the convection in the lower material. And very little material from this basal layer is actually con entrained into the convection above. This can be seen if you take a look at the basal, at the basal layer field um, at the end of the, of the model run. There's nearly no red color in the upper half of the domain. A reasonable question to ask now would be what controls the stability of this dense material at the core mental boundary in our model? There are two candidates that come to mind immediately that can control the stability of this layer. For one, the heating from the core mantle boundary below controls how hot this material gets and how much the temperature reduces the density of this material. And the second one is the intrinsic density contrast of this, of this layer, so the density anomaly that this material carries with it. In fact, there are a number of other factors 
uh, that control the layer stability, but for this tutorial, we'll just ignore them for the second. Um, for the next part of the tutorial, I would like to separate the group into, into three smaller groups that run different models so that in the end we can compare the results between you. And I would suggest that about this part of the audience forms group number one, that about this center part of the audience forms group number two, and this part of the audience forms group number three. And I would like you to change the parameter file that we ran before and rerun the model and then compare the results to the first run. You can change the parameter file by opening a terminal, going to the same directory and open the parameter file in leafpad if you have closed leafpad in between or go to the directory and double click on the file. And then I would like you to change some of the parameters in this file. In particular, I would like everyone to change the parameter output directory to a new output directory. This is in order to not overwrite the result of your first model run. So if you forget to do this, you will lose the result of your last geodynamic model. Then I would like group number one to look for the parameters called bottom temperature and gravity slash magnitude and change them from these values to these values. Group number two, please look for the parameter density differential for compositional field one and change it from 150 to 105. And for group number three, you're kind of special. I would like you to do to change all of these parameters in the way that is specified down here. Yeah, you have most of the work. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> but you'll also have the most interesting result, okay. if that helps. <laughs> yes? Um, I noticed some of the inputs are integers, some are real numbers. Does it, if they're already a real numbers, do they need to stay real numbers? Will that cause an issue? No, no, it will not cause an issue. Um, so there are some parameters that aspects expect as integer. And if you try to give in real numbers, oh, sorry. If you try to give in real numbers, then it will complain. But if it expects a real number and you put in an integer, that should work. Note that the gravity is, the parameter is actually called magnitude, but it's in the subsection gravity model. When you are done changing the file, don't remember, uh, don't forget to, to save the changes. And then you can rerun the model using the same command as before. If there are any problems, then now is a good time to let us know. Well, um, I can explain what these parameters do. I would like to keep the secret about what will happen until the end of the tutorial. <laughs> so um, group number one essentially increases the temperature jump across the bottom boundary by increasing the temperature of this boundary. So from, from 2700 Kelvin, you increase the, the bottom boundary temperature to 3700 Kelvin. Um, so you would expect the convection to be more rigorous but if you paid attention this morning in, in the lecture of Bruce, 
um, we reduce the gravity by a factor, and no spoilers, but this factor will counteract the change in the Rayleigh number so that the Rayleigh number stays actually the same in this computation. Um, and we will see what kind of effect this has on the model. Um, group number two changes the intrinsic chemical density contrast of this dense basal layer from 150 to 105 kilogram per cubic square meter. And group number three does all of the above. And then we run the model with the command that is shown down here, which is the same command as before. Yes? OK. Uh, Diogo, can you take a look? Yes? Yes. <laughs> yes. So um, aspect changes the uh, possible time step by um, essentially compute. Well, there is something like a stability criterion and explicit uh, uh, methods to solve differential equations. Aspect actually uses an implicit method, so we are not bound by this stability criterion. But still, if we exceed this criterion, the solution gets more diffusive over time. And so Aspect essentially computes the courant friedrich levy uh, stability criterion for the solution and uh, chooses a time step that satisfies this condition. Um, so you likely change the model in a way that just increases the. Exactly. So you made the problem simpler to solve, and Aspect decided it just needs two time steps to solve this problem. Yes. So if you want to, you can set a maximum time step to still get a solution at times in between. Okay. While we yes. Uh, you mean between the different groups and compared to the model before? or in So in general, the time steps will be chosen automatically by aspect, and it will change from time step to time step, depending, in practice, depending on the ratio between the velocity and the size of each cell. And it looks for the biggest of these ratios, and that determines the, um, the time step it can take. Yeah, so uh, you can you can set a maximum time step. You cannot fix it to a certain time step because this way you <laughs> might not resolve features in the model. Yeah. I mean, if if you okay. okay. While we wait for this model to finish, um, I have a few more slides about computational modeling in general. Um, and this is about the question of <coughs> what are we actually trying to do with this model? Why, why do we do this? Do we just do this to get some pretty pictures for a paper? Or uh, I see some people nodding in the audience, and that <laughs> makes me really <laughs> nervous. <laughs> so what is, what is a geodynamic model? In general, models are mathematical simplifications, in our case, of the Earth. And of course, because they are simplifications, all of them are wrong compared to the Earth. No model is actually completely like the Earth, because in that case, we probably could learn as well from the Earth instead of from our model. But still, they can be useful. And they are in particular useful to formulate hypotheses and, more importantly, also test hypotheses. So let's say you go into the field, you find something, you have a hypothesis for how this formed, but you don't know whether this is consistent with the physical processes that are actually happening on Earth. So models can help you test these hypotheses. They can also help to understand processes and to, inter uh, to understand interactions between different processes, and that's actually what we are doing right now. We are changing a few different pieces in this model and see how they interact and what this will uh, cause in the results. You can use models to make predictions if you make certain assumptions. So you can say, I assume thing one, two, and three, and then I can predict what this model, or I can use the model to predict what will happen. This is called a forward model. You can also take a set of in, uh, observations 
and try to find the most plausible scenario that creates these observations. In this case, you are essentially searching for the best model. Um, this is called an inverse model, and that will actually talk about inverse theory and, uh, and this in more detail. So what should you do if you want, say you want to set up a model, or you, you have some certain question? The first thing that you should do is not thinking about the actual model setup. First, you should think about the question that you want to answer, or the hypothesis that you have that you want to test. Then you can start to think about what kind of processes do you have to include in your model to actually be able to answer this question. And this includes, for example, select the set of equations that you want to solve, or uh, think about the setup of the model um, to be able to say anything important afterwards. Only after you're finished with this, you are able to actually choose the tool that you want to use. And then there's a very important step at the end that is verification and validation, uh, and there's no time to cover this today, unfortunately. But we can, we can at least walk, well, we can say a few things about the other steps. So one of the important things, if you see a model result, either by yourself or by somebody else in a paper, always ask, what, what can this model actually tell you? You need to be aware of what you can interpret about this model and what you can't interpret about this model. So for example, let's think about our model that we just set up. What it can tell us is the influence of this intrinsic density contrast on the stability of this basal layer. Uh, we can change the density contrast and see if this layer is still stable. It can also tell us something about the influence of the temperature contrast on the stability. And we will see how these processes interact, or these parameters interact. Uh, if you take a careful look at the model results, you will also spot some deficiencies of the numerical methods that we use. And it's also interesting, especially these simple models are very good to, uh, to test the numerical methods that we use. And in the end, hopefully, I can introduce the concept of a buoyancy ratio. What our model can definitely not do is simulate Earth, or at least in the sense that it actually reproduces Earth. We already know this. We neglected a lot of important factors for this model. For example, we completely neglected radiogenic heat generation in the model. Every layer that stays in the same place for a long time will likely heat up due to radiogenic heat generation. We have an isoviscous model, which means everything moves approximately at the same speed, and um, if you apply the same force, it's more or less the same speed all over the model. And um, the Earth is not like that. The Earth has, has big differences in, in viscosity across the Earth, from the upper to the lower mantle, in the bottom layer, definitely. If you have melting, there will be all of the magnitude of difference in the viscosity. And we completely neglect this in the model. Remember that we drive the velocities at the surface and we don't know if these velocities are consistent with the, the overall convection in the model. So we don't know if this velocity would be developed, uh, would develop by itself in this model. We don't know if it's consistent with the overall Rayleigh number of the model, for example. So we don't know how this layer would react to realistic plumes and slabs from this model. And um, as already mentioned, we introduced artificial boundaries um, at the sites. And we don't know how this would influence the stability of this dense layer at the bottom. So what we can do is we can learn something about the interaction between thermal and uh, chemical density contrasts. But this model alone is not enough to tell us anything about the stability of such a layer in the Earth. OK, at this point, hopefully most of you have finished running the model setup. And I would like you to compare the original model results that you had with the ones that you just get, uh, got with the new input file. In order to do that, you will need to load the new solution.xdmf file in your virtual machine that should appear in a new directory. In order to show you this, I will cheat a bit because I have all of the outputs already here. 
but you should now have a second directory in your virtual machine. Apart from the output driven thermochemical convection, you should also have an output folder called output stability test or whatever name you gave it in the parameter file. And there's another file called solution.xdmf in this folder. And if you open this and click on apply, then you will see a different velocity field. Another model essentially on top of the model results that you had before. And you can control which of the two models you see by using these little eye icons uh, to the left of the pipeline browser. So every model with an eye is currently shown. Every model with a closed eye is currently not shown. So what I would like you to do after you have finished watching the model results, um, you can go to approximately the halfway point of the model um, by going to about time step 500 in this box in the toolbar at the top. And then compare the temperature field between the two model runs. For that, you will have to change both of them to show the temperature. And then you can click on the I button to see the differences between the, this result. This will look different for every one of you, at least for the different groups. So there are people sitting close to the boundary between group one and two. Can you maybe try to watch the results on the screens of your neighbors of the different group and see how the results look like? Are they the same? Are they different? Yes? Yes. You, you can do that by, you can, you can split the visualization window by clicking on this little button in the top right. Then you will get two side-by-side -side visualization windows. The first one, the, the vertical split. Oh, oh yes. Um, you don't have to choose. You can simply click on the I button of the model that you want to visualize, and then it should appear. So as a start, could I just get an assessment of group number one if you're if your dense layer is still stable at the core mental boundary? No? I see a lot of shaking heads. OK, what about group number two? Is, is your layer still stable at the core mental boundary? No? OK. So? OK. And have you checked how different the two results are? Not very different? A little different. OK. And what about groups number two and three? So uh, oh, first, let's start with group number three. Is your layer still stable? OK, it's still stable. How different is it from, from group number two? OK, so it's, it's, it's totally different? OK. So to make the comparison simpler, um, I have all of the model results here. This is about at the halfway time of the model, and it's not showing the temperature field, but it's showing this basal layer field um, that we had looked at before. So on the left-hand side, you see the original setup. In the center, you see the results of group number one and group number two. And on the right-hand side, you see the results of group number three. 
as you can see, the results of group number one and group number two are actually very close together, although we changed completely different parameters in the model setup. And as you can also see, the results between group number three and our original setup are actually very close, although we changed a lot of parameters compared to the first setup. This top corner? This one? Yes. Um, interesting question. I suppose that. I mean, that's quite a sharp boundary on the bottom of those two layers, right? It looks like, is that the resolution of the grid? Okay. Yes, that's, so this is about one grid size, yeah. the thickness of, of this boundary layer. So this is actually exactly the top of right cell. Yeah. Right, so I mean, the velocity has to decrease to zero right at the top right vertex because it's constrained in both normal directions, so there's a velocity of zero there. But of course, you're right, in theory, there should be particles that move into this. The velocity is linear or the velocity is quadratic? Or? The um, velocity is quadratic. So it is varying the velocity within. It is varying inside of that cell, and that's why, in theory, there should be particles with this, uh, with this anomalous con uh, composition entering this cell, yes. Um, one thing that we noticed is uh, sometimes Paraview has some problems interpolating the, the colors correctly from the vertices uh, because it has to split every, every quad into two triangles and then kind of interpolate the colors. So it might be a visualization issue. Okay. Um, without going through all of the analytic derivation, um, what we can kind of guess from these model results is that there is a trade-off that determines the stability of this dense basal layer. It's a trade-off between the thermal buoyancy that is introduced by the bottom boundary and the chemical, buoy or the chemical negative buoyancy of the dense basal layer. And in fact, you can show that there is a non-dimensional number called the buoyancy ratio that controls whether this layer is stable or whether it is dissolved in the rest of the convection. And this is essentially just the ratio between the uh, chemical density anomaly to the thermal chem um, density anomaly. And if you compute this buoyancy ratio for the four different models that we ran today, then you will see that the buoyancy ratio between the original and group number three, where we changed both the thermal and the chemical density contrast, is actually nearly the same. And the buoyancy ratio between group number one and group number two is actually nearly the same. You also said that the model between group number one and group number two is not exactly the same, although based on theory, it should be exactly the same because we kept the Rayleigh number constant and we have the same buoyancy ratio. This is, due to, uh, well, this is actually due to a number of, of reasons. One of them is I, I gave you rounded values for, for the gravity and, and for the density contrast. So they differed a little bit and mantle convection in itself depends on the initial condition and every slight deviation that you take can lead to, to increasingly different results over time. It's a nonlinear problem. The other reason is that we not exactly implement the Boussinesque approximation in this model setup. That's something, it's more involved and I, I won't explain in detail, but, but we are currently using the, the um, the full density in the temperature equation instead of a constant density. And this way, this analytic um, derivation of the buoyancy ratio and of the similarity of two models with the same Rayleigh number does not exactly hold. Um, we could have set it up that way, um, didn't it for the moment, also because it, it's important to, to understand that like slight differences in your model setup can lead to very different end results. That is right, but the, the concept of the buoyancy ratio is actually not dependent on that fact alone. So it, if, the, if the equations would be formulated in exactly the non-dimensional, in the way that the buoyancy ratio is, is derived, then the buoyancy ratio itself should determine whether the la layer is stable or not. Yes. Okay. So the buoyancy in itself in the dynamical model would actually vary quite a bit between the parameters that control the dimension. 
Exactly, yeah. Um, oh, and actually, one of the important um, things that I wanted to discuss is that the buoyancy ratio holds in, in models of uh, self-consistent convection. But we are driving convection here. We are imposing a velocity field that might not be consistent um, with the convection that would develop uh, if there wouldn't be a prescribed velocity at the surface. Um, so this is another factor that might explain why the results of group one and group two are not completely the same. Resolution is very important if you look at the amount of entrainment over time. Um, currently, we're just evaluating whether the layer as a total is stable or not. And in that sense, our resolution should be sufficient. But if you would, for example, want to quantify the amount of entrainment, um, then you would likely need a much higher resolution than we use at the moment. Okay, so much about the practical part of the tutorial. There will be some time at the end, I think, to play around with, with parameters. Um, but first, I want to say a few more things about aspect. So, um, as we saw in the output, aspect currently runs an optimized mode on your virtual machine. Um, there are two different ways to compile aspect. One is we call deep, uh, one we call debug mode, and the other one we call optimized mode. And as you might guess, uh, the debug mode is made to make it easier to find bugs in your, in your model setup or in the software. So uh, it includes a lot of internal checks to, uh, to verify that everything works as, as expected. For example, we check that the density never becomes negative. Now, you might wonder why should the density become negative, and well, it's not possible in, in, in practice and in physics, but if you think about it, if we linearize the density in terms of temperature, so if you say the density equals some reference, temperature, uh, reference density plus alpha times delta t, then this might well, be, uh, well become negative for too big of a temperature contrast. Um, so if you modify your models and um, you try a new setup or you modify the code, it's always advisable to first run in debug mode to see if you broke something. Um, only run in optimized mode if you are sure that you have the model setup that you want to run. Um, it's worth it because it's about four to 10 times faster to run in optimized mode. And uh, that means, especially if you run big models and clusters, always use this mode. Both are available in your virtual machine. Um, there's an executable called aspect that links to debug mode and aspect release that we used for this tutorial that links to the optimized or release mode. If you want to play around further with aspect, you can find all of the available options for the input file in our manual. Um, we also have a lot of example models um, of different types of models, thermal convection, subduction, rifting, um, in the folder called cookbooks. Um, and also, they are explained in the manual. Um, we have a mailing list where you can ask questions if you want to do something new, uh, and also discuss ideas that you want to implement with us first because it's easier to point you to the place where you have to change something. As I mentioned, we have a website. There is a GitHub repository where you can follow the development and um, there is a mailing list at geodynamics.org. And that's what I wanted to say about Aspect so far. Thank you. Mm -hmm. that be more close to the real world. Yeah. Um, so there are different ways to do, um, to do time reversed modeling. Um, a, a simple approach can be to just reverse the time of gravity and switch off thermal conduction, and then you kind of move backward in time. Um, it's one process that has been around for a while, and it works reasonably well for a certain amount of time because um, if you reverse the, the gravity, you essentially just reverse the, the convection process. Um, it breaks down for two reasons after a certain time. One is you cannot reverse uh, thermal conductivity. Um, and the second one is close to boundaries, you will not get the correct flow field because the, if you think about it, you can have material moving close to a boundary and then it deforms. 
And when you then switch, reverse the sign of gravity, then this whole material will just sink down. It will not like concentrate again and, and sink down like this. Um, the better way to do this is to reformulate the equations in terms of adjoint equations. And there will be a um, lecture about this later in the week, right? So I will not cover the details. Yes? So, mm, well, <laughs> honestly, probably no. So it depends on how you parameterize the, the convection in the magma ocean. But um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly, and this term is not implemented at the moment. And also, inertia terms might be important, and they are, yeah. so. So the triangular number is much, much lower, and therefore this is not something. Yeah. Because here you are saying that whole number is very far. So yeah. yeah. And that, of course, means um, you use the magma ocean more as a boundary condition for a solid state convection model. Well, it's not um, really solid state convection. It's doing the same thing exactly. as you're talking about. Yeah, so you can do that, but it's not using yeah. reasonable convection. The advantage is that then you have more ways to make conditions for your solid So what you can do in aspect at the moment is uh, you can solve two-phase flow, where you have a certain porosity, a relative low porosity, so you have essentially melt moving through a porous rock. Um, that's possible. Um, but as soon as you lose the, uh, the integrity of the solid structure, essentially, you are not any longer in the regime that aspect can solve. That's a very good question, yeah. So um, we try to be compatible with all of the major compilers. Um, many supercomputers recommend the Intel compiler. We had very mixed results compiling with the Intel compiler um, because it assumes some very specific optimizations that sometimes break things. Um, so we, we actually had the case, or let's say Ideal2, the library we are building on, had the case that, that um, the compiler compiled the program but gave the wrong result. That's definitely not in general the case, um, but um, we recommend compiling with GCC for the reason that it's the one that most of the development is happening on and so we have the most experience with it. Um, so. If, if it's absolutely necessary, then use the Intel compiler. Um, but uh, we have the most experience with GCC or Clang. Okay. Okay. And the same question can apply sometimes to the MPI libraries. Yeah. No, I, I don't think there's a particular choice there. Um, at least I didn't make any, I didn't have any bad experiences with any of them. Yes? No, that's essentially the same question as the magma ocean. So there are there are terms in the equations that are not included in aspect, and that. Yeah, you know, the, the, the exactly. So there are codes that that are designed for modeling uh, convection in the outer core, but even they are, are relatively far from from the from the dimensionless numbers of the Earth's core. Um, about ten. I, yeah, I recently learned that they are. Now they don't. Oh, they think they are now at only seven orders of magnitude off, or something. But um, no, I don't think we're quite there yet. not not yet. Okay. Actually distributed by CIG as well. Yes. Yeah. I think. The thing is, with that code, you can turn off magnetic fields for us. After the magnetic fields, we rotate the convection and continue to rotate it all the inertia.
turn anything off, actually. Uh, the thing I like about Swift, though, is what's remarkable about it is that you can change the dimensional, the non-dimensional equations that you use in the input file. Mm -hmm. Um, benchmarking is a big topic. Um, so, first of all, what exactly do you mean by benchmarking? So the like, if someone published a paper mm -hmm. finding something new, then can you, and, and that person used very specific code, then can, can, can if, if that author is willing to provide all the details about the parameter that he used or assumptions, then can someone else took those parameters and use completely different code and reproduce the results? In theory, yes. Um, in, yeah, pra in, 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 pra in practice, um, so in practice we have made the experience that many, so many realistic applications depend on very subtle, subtle choices in the numerics of, of the software. So it's often hard to, to exactly reproduce this. Um, what usually works very well is if you can design a, a problem that has an analytic solution and then compare different codes. Um, that's usually the best way to, to do a benchmarking. And, and there are many of these problems out there. Um, and of course, it's a lot of work to benchmark your code against all of these problems. Um, and that's why, um, at least in my opinion, that's why uh, many geodynamic codes have grown over the last decades. So the projects have become bigger because it's a lot of work to actually benchmark these codes against all of the things and make sure that all of the cases are correct. Mm -hmm. um, another way to benchmark the codes is to compare the codes for a problem where we don't have an analytic solution. Um, this will at least give you an idea of whether the codes agree on something. It's not, it doesn't tell you whether this is the correct solution, but at least they, they agree on something. Um, but this again runs into the problem that sometimes the numerical choices change the solution. Um, so it, it's a big issue. Um, in general, you're safe if you use a code that was benchmarked against a lot of analytic solutions. Yeah, as long as it is um, solid state convection of any mantle, you should be able to use this for other planets. And actually it was used for at least Mars and the moon. Um, I don't know about Venus. I think there was also somebody using it for Venus. Oh yeah, exactly. And I guess that's, um, that's actually one argument for making these codes as available and to collect all of these benchmarks into the projects. So uh, one of the things that we try to do with Aspect is to collect every benchmark that we do and keep it as part of the repository. So when you download Aspect, you have a benchmarks folder. There are 15 benchmarks in there that you can rerun and, and reconvince yourself that, that it actually reproduces the, the results. Um, and that's, that's way too much work for just a single researcher at, at a single institute. And that's why it's very useful to have uh, like a big user community for this code. Yeah, I, I'm from a completely different community. So, but, but I, I really appreciate your comments about like GitHubbing all these things because I sometimes find myself like not being able to reproduce myself because I've been updating my code Yes. And GitHub has been available for just a few years and dating back, you know, before then, you know, I've been updating myself. I try to keep myself sort of like organized for the versions, but often yeah. you, you find yourself like trapped because, you know, you, you updated and you erased all the previous record and 
Exactly. Yeah. So that's that's actually an important point, and and that is something that um, the computational infrastructure for geodynamics tries to promote a lot. Like there's there's a large set of best practices in commercial software development or in computational science that is applied in, in other fields already that um, that the geodynamic or the geoscience community in general would benefit from. Uh, and these are things like, like you mentioned, version control, um, automatic testing of every change. Um, things like that don't have to be complicated. They are actually relatively simple to implement uh, when, you, when you understand like the basic concept. Um, and I think that's something that, that geosciences could benefit a lot from. Would it be crazy to art ask authors to uh, archive their codes at the moment where they ran the simulation and together with the result? No, not at all. So um, there are more and more data availability statements from journals that require the software or the data to be made available. Now the question is what does made available mean? Um, oftentimes they are um, oftentimes a statement like the results are available upon request is, um, is accepted, although in, in practice that, that is still limiting the availability of, of these results. Um, on the other hand, um, the question on whether you should archive and publish all model results is, is very complicated because many of these model results are, are tens or hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes. And as long as there is no very simple way to publish that, um, it's very hard to publish all of that. But a, a very good first step that we try to promote is to at least publish the version and even better the git commit hash of, of the version that you use because that's a unique identifier for this particular code. Um, publish the input files that you used and the data files that you used to create this, this model. And this should already um, remove a lot of the usual uncertainties. Um, it's still not perfect, but it's much better than it at the moment. Okay, I think, yeah, thank you.